Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Cup. This episode is very special. As you may remember, Ron and I started releasing our long mini a mini series. All long about... mini series. That's quite <laughs> the term for it. <laughs> well, it was like nine freaking parts. It's a long mini series. Yes. <laughs> it was like nine hours of theater. It's a lot. But yeah, we talked about the RSC production of Nicholas Nickleby. That was done. That starred Alan Armstrong, Roger Reed. Ryan, who played Smike in that one? Oh, that was David Threlfall played Smike. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Oh, and... Uh, yes, Bob Peck. Oh, all right. Bob we Peck. Love, we love some Bob Peck. But... We do love Bob Peck. So yeah, Bob Peck was in that one. So yeah, no, it was a really fun, like, 80s VHS converted to streaming production that they did. So... Ron and I joked about this in many of the episodes that, hey, once we finish this, since we're on a Nicholas Nickleby role, let's do the 2002 Charlie Hunnam film. Because, you know, people were loving our miniseries so much, they were just begging for more Nicholas They were Nickleby knocking content. down the doors to see more of our thoughts. <laughs> exactly. But, like, but, you know, you say it jokingly, but, like, yeah, we were always open to entertaining that idea, but I think we both needed about a year-long break yes. from all things Nicholas Nickleby. But it's I like true. that now we have the benefit of hindsight. The whole thing is behind us, and we can, it's yeah, true. as a nice commemorative <laughs> celebration of that long mini series, so we can dive back into this well one more time. Exactly. Well, I mean, there is a TV movie out of it, starring Charles Dance. Yes, saw that, and Wilson's in that one too, as yes. according to Wikipedia, the Lord. So I'm guessing he wasn't very famous yet at the time. No. <laughs> no. Um, but yes. No, I know there are other versions, you know, maybe if people really, really, really want to see more. But let's keep doing film reviews of Nick Lowe's. We can consider it, but honestly, I will get into this in my thoughts as we go on. But I, after having seen this version and the RSC version, I, I, I feel like what we just were going to be reviewing today might be my idea of the definitive Nicholas Nickleby. Well, so I, I yes. don't know if we need to personally, I will be fine if I never see another Nicholas Nickleby because we have two very good versions under our belt. I mean, I will say having, while well, watching, so I kept thinking like, there's a lot of notes in here that like, Brian in our last episode of like, ways to adapt this kind, they kind of took notes from it. And I was like, but oh. this is from 2002. So they like, Future people who went back in time to make this? Who knows? No, it's so, okay. Ask me what's in my cup before we get it. Yes, that's true. What is in your cup? We haven't gone in there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We can dive right into this review, but we have a lot of thoughts. I have a structured list of things I want to make sure we talk about. But So I'm drinking decaf coffee. We're filming mm-hmm. this in the middle of the afternoon. But yesterday, at time of filming, was my birthday. And I'm uh, visiting my folks for a couple days. Uh, well, Jill is actually currently in Calgary at time of recording, yes. doing... Flash, which you might have heard of, the musical that we interviewed. Not about, about the DC superhero. No, not to be confused. Anyway, so I'm visiting my folks for a couple days, and yesterday was my birthday, and they gave me this cool bamboo travel mug that has little slots on it. Oh. So even though I'm not traveling, I felt like it was worth <laughs> filling Love it up that. to break it out for this recording. Love that. Well, I am back to my regular silver tankard, and as you can see, it is very humid, so it is a sweating glass of pink lemonade. Well, okay, nice stuff. Yes, with a splash of ginger ale to give it some fizz. Mm-hmm. Lovely. Yes. But let's get into this. Yes. So this film came out in 2002. It was written and did by Douglas McGrath, who I have no idea who this director is, but he's lovely. But I want to see more of his work. Like, I actually, the minute I stopped watching this, I Googled, not him? Douglas McGrath, well, it came shortly after, but the first thing I Googled is, what won the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay this year? that then in 2002 when it came out because i'm like it? it was the pianist which is a fine movie this was the year yeah. that chicago won best picture i knew this was well gonna be a uh, mixed feelings but, but like this it was a, it's a very good adaptation we're very good sure movie. i will concede it's a good adaptation do i love the movie do i love the play not really so that's <laughs> you know that's on me <laughs> but whatever chicago won best picture i knew this wouldn't really be a best picture contender but adapted no, screen happen. But like, okay, The Pianist is a fine movie. I obviously don't care for Roman Polanski as a person. Does um, anybody? <laughs> well, no, I hope not. But the, he was already, we already knew what he did when The Pianist won both Best Director and Best Picture. So yeah, um, that's why nobody clapped when he won. <laughs> yeah. So quiet. anyway, I feel like we need to relitigate the 2003 Oscars and make sure that, you know, this Nicholas Nickleby gets the love it deserves because, yeah, this was wonderful. It was, it was. And I mean, the cast, we'll dive deeper into them, but it's a star-studded cast. We have Charlie Hunnam, 
before he did that awful King Arthur movie. And also before he did that, what was that motorbike show he was on? The Sons of Anarchy. Sons was of he Anarchy. Also, he was also in Vikings, right? Like the History Channel yes. show? Yes. Yeah, yes. I, mean, I never yeah, watched he was that. In that. He's been in a lot of stuff. I recently just watched the, not very good, but the, the A Million Little Pieces movie, the adaptation of the James Frey. Never seen You know, it. hoax autobiography. Yeah, he had a small part in that, but he's good. I like Charlie, Charlie Hunnam. He's a good actor. And I feel like here, he's obviously early in his career. Yeah, where we yes. might as well just do the star-studded cast talk here since we've already brought yeah. it up. But yeah, he's a very good actor. Clearly, this is early in his career and he's uh, still cutting his teeth, still figuring out. But I think this... Mm -hmm. Being in this production, acting opposite all of these veterans really did mm -hmm. bring him up to the next level. And, yeah. you know, it was a great apprenticeship, if you will. Just like this is kind of the classic apprenticeship Bildungsroman type story. Yeah. So it makes sense that he as an actor would get to grow after working with all these people and acting opposite them. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, he's Nicholas. You have Nathan Lane as Vincent Crummels. Mm -hmm. You have Jim Brobbitt, Professor Slughorn, as many people know him from Harry Potter. Yeah. as the villainous wax waxford squeers yeah um, with an actual like eye like deformity mm. in the eye this time not like, right whereas alan armstrong it. just squinted the whole time which, which makes i sense. mean i'm still very impressed he did that and held that yeah. for so long on stage and he that played was... a couple other characters alan yes. armstrong so he couldn't like hold he couldn't have that actually like bandaged up yeah sort of or made it over exactly uh, but yeah very very good makeup job on jim broadbent mm -hmm. in this yeah mm -hmm. but he says in there's waxford squeers you have the late great Canadian Christopher Plummer oh as God. Ralph Nickleby. Ooh, you we've have made our thoughts on Christopher Plummer very well known on this show. Watch our episodes on The Tempest. Or... Oh, we'll dive into <laughs> the interpretation of Ralph. I have yes. thoughts on it. Okay, sure. And then we have Jamie Bell as Smike, Anne mm -hmm. Hathaway as Madeline Bray, Al Cumming, or Cummings, sorry, Cumming. Yeah. As, uh, as Mr. Full Air. You have Timothy Spall as Charles Cherubal. Fun fact about Timothy Spall, actually, sorry to interrupt the yeah, flow no. of listing all these celebrities' names, but again, I was just kind of like refreshing my memory about which actors played certain roles in the RC version versus mm -hmm. the actors in this, so I have my list in front of me here, <laughs> and Timothy Spall originated the role of Little Wack in the Did RC he? production. We didn't see him because he'd already right. been replaced by yeah. another actor by the time they filmed it. But yes, right. he originated the role of Little Wackford and a few other bit parts. Ah. So yeah, Squeers Jr. So honestly, I would have, knowing that little bit of trivia, I kind of would have loved, you know, Jim Broadbent was great and maybe he would have been a very interesting Charles Cherrible, but I would have loved to see Timothy Spall's version of Big Wackford, Mr. Squeers, as the he kind of logical evolution. I think he would. Well, yeah, he is that kind of actor where, you know, he's either in Harry Potter or a Mike Lee movie. He's, you know, he's always a force to be reckoned with. So it is true. Mm -hmm. true. I mean, like I can picture it kind of like his Beatle from Sweeney Todd is kind of his version yeah. of Squeers. Right, anyway. right, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we have him. We have Ta Tom Courtney as Mr. Newman Noggs seen here. Crack. I was about to crack. say, we got Cracker Knuckles. <laughs> so good. I'm glad they kept that. Yep. Then we also have, who else we got in here? Barry Humphreys as Mrs. Crummles. <laughs> Dame Edna. Barry, yeah, I was about to say, Dame Edna, if you don't know. So it's a very interesting casting choice. We'll get more into that, I'm sure. Let's see who else do we have in here. Have we talked about Kate yet? Who played Kate? Too? No, I was actually about to mention her, actually. Ramola uh, Gary. Ramola Gary, who was right now starring in Becoming Elizabeth as Mary First. Mary the First. Uh, yep. Queen Mary. Bloody Mary. Yeah, yeah cool. playing but Bloody Mary. Nice. But yeah, so we have that. Fanny Squeers, played by Heather Golden Hirsch, mm -hmm. which, I mean, once again, a great I have, performance. I have big thoughts about Fanny that we will come back to. But <laughs> we'll yes, I feel Fanny. like those are, oh, and I guess David Bradley is the last That's big star that we get to. David Bradley in a very small yeah. role. Yes, was Mr. Bray, Mr. <laughs> which... Bray. But like the second I saw him on screen, I'm like, of course, Walter Frey yeah. is playing this role. Who else but Walter yes. Frey? Like, yeah. I, I honestly feel Mr. bad. Mr. Filch, for... Walter Frey. Like... Yeah, like I feel bad for David Bradley that he's just like so typecast as these horrible, hateable villain characters. Actually, but, like... he's actually really good in the uh, BBC Les Mis where he plays Mary's hmm. grandfather, where he has a turn of heart at the end. That's cool. Okay, good for him. Yeah, yeah like but I mean, he's, he's his made career for, uh, typecasting, so he's done yeah. well for himself. Yeah, no, he's clearly done well, but I was like, oh, yes, perfect casting, but also, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is so man. perfect casting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, and then Edward Fox plays Sir Mulberry Hawk, 
Yes. Who gets quite a revision in this. Yes, which I we will talk about because I, yes. I have big thoughts about that. <laughs> yeah. And then William Ash plays Frank Cherable. And Ooh. yeah, I think that's... Yeah, those are most of the big stars it. got named at this point. Yeah. 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 But yeah, that's the cast. So Ryan, let's get into our overall thoughts. What did you think yeah. of this in general, in a general comparison to our RSC version that we did, that we did? So in case you couldn't tell from my enthusiasm going into this, <laughs> I absolutely loved this version. And I loved the RSC version too. That will always have a very special place in my heart, but as I kind of, you know, made no bones about it in our multiple episodes, especially episode seven of, <laughs> uh, of that miniseries, the RSC version is occasionally a bit of a mess. I love it. And somehow its messiness just makes it even more charming, but it is kind of all over the place. They had too big a canvas to work with. And I think this film is proof in the pudding that necessity is the mother of invention the old mm -hmm. proverb because in two hours and change they did you know the entire story obviously big cuts were made but nothing that very felt big cuts. big cuts but to me it was nothing that like i don't know we're, we'll come back to this but if you remember in my last episode in the last episode i did my script doctoring which I, in preparation for watching this, I re-listened to that last episode of the, the oh, miniseries to just like, I, I remember I did that script doctoring, but what were the specific points I brought up? So I wrote them down and we'll come back to each one of them specifically. But yeah, like as you sort of hinted at, they, this production seemed to take a lot of my cues. Now, obviously they did it before me and I'm not going to try to take credit and claim that a flux capacitor was involved in their <laughs> screenwriting decisions. But I, to me, I think I'm not that clever. Just the things that I was pointing out of where to trim the fat to me are just the obvious choices. And this film not only, you know, made came to a lot of the same conclusions of, okay, how do we turn this juggernaut massive book mm -hmm. and very famous stage production into just a streamlined two hour movie, yeah. but they actually came up with even better solutions than some of the ones that I came up with. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into more detail specifically. I think we could leave it there, but yeah, I, to me, as an adaptation scholar, and again, this is it's also interesting because I, to this day, have still not read the novel Nicholas Nickleby. <laughs> Come and on, Ryan, you, you're on well, yeah, break between your classes. Come on. Well, yeah, I, if I was going to read it, it would have been in anticipation of our mini series. Now, <laughs> and that's the thing, but the RSC version to me was very spectators digest with very little digest, if we're being honest. It was saying, <laughs> now that you've seen this, you really don't have to read the novel because we have been slavishly faithful to it. Yes. If I had, if this film had been my first exposure, then I might have been inclined to be like, oh, yeah, let's read the novel and see what was different. But having seen that version, I feel like I've basically read the novel. I've had people read large passages of the novel to me in a lot of the <laughs> third person narration that we have in there. And as a result, like, you know, I may or may not have quoted this in one of our Nicholas Nickleby episodes or just a previous other episode of The Cup, but it's from Linda Hutchian's book, A Theory of Adaptation, where she says paraphrasing because I don't have the exact quote in front of me, that adaptations of Dracula today are more often adaptations of earlier adaptations than they are of Bram Stoker's novel. And that's, that's very much how I feel going into this, that I can read this as adaptation without having needed to read the original source because I see, I've seen another version that they are very clearly, not necessarily responding to, but maybe took inspiration from and took cues from and, you know, similarly had ideas of, okay, that's what we would do if we had nine hours, but we don't. So how do we trim the fat? And I was very happy with the result. And yeah, it was just, sorry, last thought, I started this before and then I got sidetracked in my head, but <laughs> as an adaptation scholar approaching this work, this is why I love adaptation. And because, you know, you went on a lot in a lot of our episodes about, you know, the miniseries. And you said like, oh, I want it to be faithful. That's what Dickens wanted. I like how they're respecting that. But to me, adaptation is just that. It's adapting, it's changing, it's making it different. And, you know, what is fun about approaching something as adaptation, mm -hmm. to use another kind of, you know, coinage or truism from Linda Hutchian, is that we get this palimpsestuous pleasure, this comparative gaze that makes us enjoy this more because we see the creative process through the product that we can understand mm -hmm. why certain decisions are made because we have something to compare it to. 
Right. And that's what, you know, I was just giddy watching this because <laughs> I was getting so much pleasure in the creative solutions they were coming up with to things that I identified yeah. as problems in the previous version. Yes. Okay, that's me. How about you? <laughs> I mean, I watched this a long time ago, which is why, <laughs> like, I knew it existed. It's why I knew Jamie Bell's performance as Smike. But I hadn't gone back. I didn't go back and rewatch it before we did the miniseries. But that being said, I, it's always been in the back of my head. Um, so it was definitely nice to revisit this piece again. And I mean, what's, I will say it is a very good adaptation. Do I feel sometimes I'm like, yeah, you pulled it in a lot of characters or a lot of elements to consolidate. Like, damn you, Tim Lincoln Water. Okay, well, it. if you remember, Tim Lincoln Water was on my list of things I think we can cut. It was one yes, that I was hard pressed to cut because I like that character. Yeah. But I recognize combined him with Frank. Yeah, and I recognize that we didn't need him to make the plot work, and clearly our director screenwriter also recognized that because yeah. yeah, we don't need him. It's a shame. He's fun, but Douglas McGrath agrees with me. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I mean, there are elements where it's like there's certain characters I love who just obviously get cut. It's like watching Harry Potter and certain characters like Peeves, the poltergeist, who like you read the book and he's so fun in the book, and then it's just you cut him for the sake of time or you cut him for the sake of whatever. And I mean, that's what I like about this is it's an adaptation, but I can see why they change certain things and why they consolidate certain things and change certain elements there. Like definitely it all kind of came together really well. And this film has great flow to it, even if it kind of gets screwed over in this adaptation, <laughs> which we'll get more into. That's on mine. Yeah, that's um, on mine. It's on mine too. We'll come so, back to Kate. I mean, to justify that, it's like what they said in Harry Potter when they were trying to consolidate those books into films. It's like, we only need the plot elements that are essential to Harry's story. As much yeah. as Hermione's story about Spew is a great side story, it ain't necessary. We cut it. It's gone. I know. Cut Nicholas the is the title character. If you yeah. recall, it's his movie. In our, if you recall in our final episode, which I had actually forgotten that I said this, but rewatching it now, I made the bold radical suggestion that what if we were to do a version where we consolidate the characters of Kate and Nicholas and make it Kate's story, the adventures of Kate Nickleby. <laughs> which, yeah i'm still not a fan of that one <laughs> well again it wouldn't be to yeah. replace it's not the re spectator's digest version now you don't have to read the book it's a you've yeah. read the book isn't this actually better don't we like kate more than we like nicholas anyway <laughs> i don't know charlie Hunnam was a very compelling nicholas he was i've already said my piece on him yeah. you have more thoughts on his performance before we move on i mean not yet i'll save them because cool. we'll get more into the cast in a bit sure. uh, but yeah i mean generally once again, these are two very different forums. The RSC was given a big budget and said, hey, you can do this in two parts. Have at it. And they went at it. They so, did. and then this is a film where it didn't make back its budget. It only made, like, I'm looking here at the lovely Wikipedia page. It was a budget of $10 million, which is very monstrous during the cast they got. And it only recouped $3.7 million. So, hmm. an edit it Which is a shame. Even like, though yeah. the reviews are really good. I mean, it's got it got very favorable reviews, but guess the public just wasn't eager it's, for and i also just feel like nicholas nickleby as a property doesn't have the same cachet as something like the christmas carol or even Oliver twist. twist or yeah and like i feel like out of the dickens canon those are the two that like everybody Great expectations gets up there it gets up tale of two cities probably also but oh, nicholas I nickleby i think if it wasn't for the rsc nicholas nickleby <laughs> We, this movie probably would have never been made with the budget that it uh, had. Like, no, what I think is also interesting is this came out a couple years before Joe Wright's adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, which really True. feels like, you know, a lot of people point to that as sort of the definitive, yeah. you know, faithful yet innovative period adaptation, mm -hmm. you know, high art, but still commercially successful, perfectly threading that needle, which, and I think this is a pretty checks all those same boxes in my mind minus the commercially successful apparently which is a shame because it really feels like i would show this film to anyone regardless of whether or not you have prior knowledge yeah. of the source material yeah. or even interested yeah. in dickens yeah absolutely so i think it definitely hits its mark of what it was aiming to do which is when you want to adapt charles dickens novel into a film adaptation with a star studded cast and it i would give it a 10 out of 10 on that level absolutely and yeah we'll get more dive deeper but it's overall it's a, definitely a fun project and i said it joking that we should re revisit this but i'm glad we are because i think once again it's a deeper oh, yeah. dive and who knows right i mean this may launch a whole new series of ryan and mac reviewing film adaptations of plays like yeah maybe and i'm interested in that we did like our little meet the team series where yeah. like, you know you talk what was it your pick 12 angry men for that yeah that, yeah, yeah. Mine was 12 angry men 
But I would do doubt or yeah. noises off. There's a whole list of plays you can do. We can All do right, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> we'll talk. Camera. Who knows? There could be something coming, people. We may have just sparked a, another brainchild here. Anyway, so let's get more into the cast because oh. it is star studded. So, Ryan, yes. just like our regular check ins we did with Nicholas Nickleby, where we did who was your standout? Out of the yeah, star studded so, cast, do you have a standout performance? Uh, there's so many good ones, and I would love to comment on all of them, but I think if I had to give one shout out, it's Christopher Plummer. It's got to be Christopher Plummer. Ike, no? No. Oh, what's that face? Do you uh, care to comment? <laughs> We're talking about Plummer now. Let's do this. Oh, well, I mean, I was going to save him for things you weren't a big fan of. But okay. I guess we can talk about it now. No, we might as well if you have other stuff to discuss in that <laughs> well, section. First, well, first, no, no, no. First, you say what you liked, I will counter. All right. Let's be fair. Let's start with the positive. Okay. So John Woodvine, who played Ralph in the RSC version, I loved him. I thought he was great. He was the very first shout out I gave in the first episode. Yep. He was standout. Um, standout. He's campy. He's a very over the top campy villain. Mm -hmm. He he took the director note that this character has no soul and he ran with it. And then which at times, like, you know, in the final episode when he, you know, has to go through an emotional ringer, you know, he gives still gives a great performance, but it's it feels less of like the logical place mm -hmm. for that character to go and more like emotional whiplash. It was Plummer doesn't know the meaning of the word camp, in yeah. my opinion. And like, you know, that may or may not to some that might be a good thing, others to others not, but I thought right off the bat he brought depth to this villain character without ever having that emotional depth sacrifice the fact that he is a villain and what makes him a villain. And yeah, this is something that I was going to maybe talk about a little later, but I can bring it up now. This isn't Plummer's fault. This is maybe just a slight fault in like some of the writing and directing, but I feel like this version couldn't decide if Ralph was lusting after Kate. Which part of my notes? That's part of your notes. Okay. Well, again, I'm not going to fault Plummer for that confusion. Honestly, I feel like maybe uh, RSC yeah, didn't hit the nail on the head either on this. No, they didn't. And I'm guessing, if having not read the novel, I would guess Dickens probably went back and forth on that, and that's maybe why. Well, he's pretty more definitive that there's some heavy lusting there. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, but maybe he just doesn't pay off the threads, and that's why each adaptation yeah. doesn't necessarily know what to do with that mm -hmm. point. I would have been happier if they just cut that out altogether, mm -hmm. this version at least, and just made it like, yep. I don't think he, he could, just... though, with the way they've restructured it, that he doesn't send them away, that he keeps them in the house. Well, I think you could, because yeah. she's still part of his ploy to get Mulberry Hawk to seduce her and then get his investment. And his investment became a lot more prominent to the plot mm -hmm. here than it was even previously. Mm -hmm. So I, like, I think I would have maybe loved if Ralph was just sassy, asexual villain, kind of. That, <laughs> whereas kind of one little ding against his performance that I don't really think was his fault is it was just muddled about whether or not he's having these feelings about Kate. But otherwise, I thought he was just a class act, and he just brought that Christopher Plummer Prospero gravitas to every scene he was in. And certainly, like, in the two Christopher Plummer productions that we've reviewed here before, yes. which were, you know, The Tempest and Caesar and Cleopatra, mm -hmm. those are both interesting because they're both characters that could be seen as kinds of villains. I think Prospero's a villain. <laughs> well, I would agree, but he played them in a way that you can't help but love them. And same True. with Caesar. Yes, it's, well, it's Captain Von Trapp. I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. Well, I know. And I would say that's exactly what he did here. Like, he's able to make you forget that you're supposed to hate this character because of how charismatic and great he is. And I can't hate that. Like, and so, I don't know, like, what was your, I just thought we would be unanimous about this. So let's hear what you have to say. <laughs> I had a feeling we would disagree on this. So for me, my thing with Plummer is just as you said, what was his name? You played him in the RSC version. John Woodvine. John Woodvine was maybe too broad. I would say Plummer was too subtle. Hmm. Where this is a story of big characters. I mean, you have one-eyed Waxford Squeers <laughs> and Mrs. Squeers and Fanny and the Crummles and Mr. Newman Noggs, who's put him up, put him up, fisty cuffs him the whole time, and also the Cherubles of 
damn you, Tim Lincoln Water. Like no, very not in this cool. version. Yeah. Not in this version, but still they were very kind of big, broad yes. cartoon shoes. And even David Bradley was kind of big in this too. Like his what? reactions were very big. So I mean, this is a big character show. And Plummer was so subtle in his villainy that I almost didn't read him as villainous enough for the part. Like the only time I really kind of enjoyed him was in that first scene where he's talking with Nicholas and uh, Mama Nickleby. And Kate. which, according to Wikipedia, she has a name in this version. That's yes, Catherine, she does. Catherine. Which she she was never named in the no. Other version. I still say we call her Mama, <laughs> She's Mama, Mama Nickleby. Mama Nickleby. Yeah, Mama Nickleby. But I mean, that's something there where, like. Could, when, when he was giving, the con- giving his icy quips at them, like, and now he's in the ground, like something like that, yep. where he was kind of giving these proverbs of villainy, basically, at them. And that was a few times where I thought, okay, you're kind of a bit of a fun sly guy. But then when we get into like some of the darker stuff of him, like, try of him setting up Kate and things like that, like, even toward the end when he's realizing what's happened and what have I done, sweet Jesus, what have I done? That type of thing there, you know, where it's going up to the attic. It was so subtle that I'm like, in a more subtle film that was more centered around the subtlety of that world, that probably would have played better. But here, because he because was so subtle, he almost felt grandfatherly night. Like, almost, it was almost like Judge Turpin meets Captain, like uh, a slightly, a, light, a lighter version of Judge Turpin meets a slightly darker version of Captain Von Trapp. Mm-hmm. Where it's like it, I, I, it's that weird brain met performance child of lighter on the on a very dark character and slightly darker on a not so or, or on a slightly more gray character and it it, it was just it, I didn't feel the villainy enough in his performance okay. to really justify me going yes he got yeah, his see- just desserts at the end by committing suicide like he goes out and suicide I'm like oh so his suicide in particular again. I was going to save this for later because it's not Plummer's fault. <laughs> I don't feel like the staging of his suicide was handled the best way. We'll come back to no. that later. Yeah, but, yeah, we'll come but back. The, but I, yeah. I, I don't blame Plummer or his performance for that. But, but for me, I just go like, once again, this character is so juicy as a villain with the backstory he has and just the, the things he does throughout the piece. Like the, he's the master chess player who ultimately gets out like, like un, uh, unwittingly outmatched at the end. And so I never felt his puppet mastery uh, of moving the pieces around the board. It always kind of felt like he was just there observing. Like him at the dinner watching them mock Kate didn't feel villainous enough. Like he didn't feel like he, like I, I didn't escalate him. And then he's comforting her at the end with the wipe away the tears and all that shit. And it's like, no, if you're a bad guy, you don't care that she's crying. You tell her to get back in there. Like that's where you can show just how cruel of a person you are to keep spurring Kate on and say, no, we're leaving. Like give like, like give a little bit more villainy. Later. I don't think that's Plumber's fault. I think he's just I mean, I met him, he was a bit of a curmudgeon, but that's besides the point. Um RIP. RIP. A very brilliant man, very brilliant actor. Like it just he just wasn't villainous enough for me, where I where where compared to John Woodbine Woodbine. Yeah. Yep. Him I liked because he took it to such a level. And I mean, the ending where he's walking and they're doing the 80s like overexposure and the voices. And yes, it was big, but it worked because they understood. They both worked. My praise for Plummer is not to detract praise from Woodbine. (laughs) No, I I, I I like Woodbine more just because I got it right away that he was the villain. There was a subtlety of, oh, the gracious man. And I mean, I, I think they were going for like a twist villainy in this. Where yeah, or at least false sense of security. Exposed. Yeah, like this is it was like never got the twist. <laughs> like See, never quite came across as like the big villainous twist that I think they were going for in this. Of surprise, yeah. he's a bad guy who's selling Kate out. All right, like I will say, just mm-hmm. we kind of have to move on, but just to yes. sort of wrap up a little bow on this. Yes, I love Woodvine. I love Plummer. I love how different their two interpretations were Very from different. each other. That. Plummer wasn't being like, yeah, that's a good interpretation. I'll just do what that guy did, yeah. that he really no. didn't make the role his own. And I, I do highly respect that. And I like yeah. that we got a different, maybe more subtle, maybe creepier, less high camp melodrama mm-hmm. version of this character that when he did have his emotional breakdown at the end, I did buy it a lot more than I ever okay. did in the previous version. That's fair. Yeah, you know who I think would have been even better? Uh, what's his name? Ralph in this? Sure. Who? Alan Rickman. Yeah. Also, that RIP. I would have gotten um, the villainy of more in him. Like I, like I feel he would have 
played it just because uh, uh, he ha- already has that natural voice. I mean, that's probably also Plummer's thing too. Is he uh, he speaks in such a tenor voice mm-hmm. that compared to Woodbine in R.I.P. Alan Rickman, they have that baritone voice that kind of sits a bit lower and can be a turn on the yeah. menace really easily compared to Plummer, who is talking this really soft kind of sultry voice. <laughs> Of. Fair. Yeah, I would love to see yeah. to have seen an Alan Rickman version that yes. we sadly will never get now, but yeah. Charles Dance, I imagine, would be very good at it too, which, yes, if we Charles ever Dance, do... Yes, Tywin Lannister, like, that, yeah. like, that's, like, that's the type of subtlety villainy that I think Ralph needs, of, like, a king doesn't need to say I am the king, <laughs> right? Like, it's that type of... It, it's just the eyes. It's, I, I almost... It, like, watching Plummer's eyes, they almost look too soft and right. fatherly. There needs to be a coldness in those eyes, a mm-hmm. detached, emotionless look at them. Like he's just viewing them as money or as collateral. It's not human, you know? Like uh, that scene where he's wiping Kate's tears away just felt too human for Ralph. Where I'm yes. like, no. Anyway, but yes, we got to wrap up. Uh, yeah. to who, who is your shout out? I, I think I could guess who it was going to be. Is it Nathan well, Lane? <laughs> well, I mean, I do love Nathan Lane. Do not right. get me wrong. But. I will actually say my shout out is Juliet Stevenson mm. as Mrs. Squeers. Agreed. She was great. Because she stepped up and became more of a villain than Waxford Squeers. Mm. I actually feared her more than Jim Broadband's Squeers, where in the other production, it felt more like Alan Armstrong's Squeers is more the driving villainous force of that pairing. Yeah, this time around, they were more even footing. Yeah. I would say it's more heavy handed on her. She is the driving villainous factor of that pairing. And I loved it. I thoroughly, because mm-hmm. I actually felt the love between those two. I was like, oh, yes. you two actually have a dark, twisted, yet healthy, in their view, mm-hmm. relationship. Where it's like they are evil partners in crime who are extorting these children. But just her subtle looks that she would give to Nicholas and just that stony face she gave and just that menace of her going out in the carriage to hunt down Smike. It was like watching uh, Margaret Hamilton on the broom as the Wicked Witch of the West taking off, like, I'll go this way, you go that way. It's like so wonderfully villainous that it was that it was great. I mean, the only thing that made me sad about this adaptation, and we'll get more into this, is just the ending that we don't see more of their just desserts that we see yeah. in the... There's in no it. reference to Australia whatsoever. I'm <laughs> no furious. Reference. <laughs> no reference. But yeah, no, I loved her performance because she was such a subtle character in the RSC version didn't quite get her attention because obviously in the stage show and in this it she doesn't go along to the city to go get Smike and all those yeah. misadventures in the city it's Fanny who goes who is part of that adventure in this because there's so much going on at the schoolhouse and just venom that she spits out all the time like she picks off Nicholas right away in that whole we will break his spirit it's like, yeah. I actually believe you will. Yeah, I, I think you can accomplish that goal. You will do it. <laughs> so I yeah. thoroughly enjoyed her performance. But no I will say, shout out to Nathan Lane. I love Nathan Lane. He is, yeah. once again, but he, it was just Nathan Lane with, this, with a modest British accent. Mm-hmm. So, But it was still that same type of performance. It's, that is camp. I mean, Nathan Lane knows when you, well, like, particularly he knows I'm playing camp and he knows how to do it right. And that's the key. one character who can definitely get away with it no matter what. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And he, I mean, he knows the joke. He understands what the joke of the, of the character is. And then he also understands the heart. Nathan Lane is very good at bringing heart to camp. Like, watch him in that scene where he's trying to convince Nicholas to stay. And it's the, we will say this is your last performance. Extended by positive this. <laughs> and, like, he's yeah. dragging it on. And it's like, oh, yes. this is a little bit of your Max Bialystok in a way. Yeah, but then when Nicholas great. says, no, like, picture it, like, Kate to me is like, your, what's her name? The drunk child that they have. Oh, yeah. He's the infant pretend. phenomenon. Yes, the minute you, in the minute he, Nicholas says that, you see Nathan Lane's expression completely 180, and he goes, yeah. "I get it. You go do your thing." And yeah. it's like that's what's so great about that. And I mean, just also brilliant casting of Barry Humphreys as Mrs. Crumbles. I mean, 2002. The fact that we had some great transgender performance work, yeah, uh, there, and or I guess cross dressing. I don't because it, it was cross dressing because it don't male, but he's quite known for his female performances as Dave Edna and etc. And it wasn't over the top. Like, it wasn't, no, like, isn't it, it like funny it that a woman... No, Beach and the producer where he comes out in the dress says, yeah. I am the Grand Duchess Anastasia. It's like, yeah, very like, funny, was, but to me, not if, what they were going for. It was so, even, like, those wouldn't have known. It, like, it, they didn't draw attention to that partnership. Yeah, they and because they didn't draw attention to it, mm-hmm. to me, 
like I knew that because I've seen Dame Edna before, I knew that yeah. the actor wasn't trans, but to yes. me it just felt like the character was trans. And then the fact that we had a possibly trans character that nobody referenced or batted an eye at, that's quite progressive for 2002. I loved it. Yeah, I, loved I thought it. it was great. Really. So yeah, like I have more to say about the character of the Crumbles and there were some plot later. But uh, yeah, Nathan Lane is exactly what you pay for. It's the label on the box is what you get. Yes. It's Nathan Lane, of course. He was perfect. Yes. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay, so check-ins or lack thereof, as we say. So, yeah. Ryan, this time there was no scar. Nicholas no. never got his cheek scar. No. What other so check-ins do we always do? There was so no I, I, check-in this time. Yeah, so I did. The, I wrote down the what were the five check-ins that we used to do because it's been so long. The first one was yeah. the adaptation. How is it like the book check-in, which this whole episode will be that, so we can put a pin in that. Exactly. Um, we'll, we'll keep going back to that topic. Yeah, the scar, which for those listening to this who for some reason haven't seen, I have you not had the time to watch our whole <laughs> 10 plus hours? Yeah, Nicholas gets a latch on his face when he's having his scuffle with Squeers in the mm-hmm. RSC version. And that scar was something that we were tracking across the episodes, but no scar in this version. Yep. So easy. We had the Lay Miz check in. So for those unfamiliar with that, because Trevor Nunn, John, John Trevor Nunn, not Trevor, Trevor Nunn, Nunn. The Trevor Nunn. Yeah, yeah. So because these two who were directing this production later went on to create the Les Mis Day show that we all know and love, and we were noticing a lot of similarities between this story <laughs> and Les Mis, so we were kind yes. of tracking, we were using, as I phrased it many times in those episodes, we were using Nicholas Nickleby as a prism through which we could see a germinal form of what would eventually become Les Mis. Les so, Mis, yeah. But obviously we're dealing with different creatives now. It's not helmed yeah. by none and cared. So we can skip that here. I'm going to skip one of them in a second, but we had our individual episode ranking kind of check-in mm. where we, and we talked about how each one worked as a standalone unit of right. episodic television, which we can't do here because it's just one standalone perfect movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, not perfect, but a very good movie that uh, yes. does everything well. But the one check-in that I skipped, and now we come back to it because it's the big one that I mm-hmm. think we need to talk about, yes. was our what we called our Smike check-in. <laughs> and, yes. and that was, you know, we talked a lot in every single episode mm-hmm. about the actor David Threlfall, who played Smike in the RSC production. Mm-hmm. And how he seemed to be doing very earnestly, but nonetheless problematically, caricature of somebody on the autism spectrum. Yes. And or some kind of neurodivergent person. Mm. And multiple times while we were having these discussions, our check-ins where we were kind of wondering, like, is this going to be the thread throughout? Is he going does he, to... Does he improve as he gets further and further away from the yeah. spheres? Yeah. That was case... our original thought of, will he, like, will his yeah. mental cognition improve as he gets yeah. more love from the and, kids? And if he had, that could have been a problematic can of worms on its <laughs> own, like it's saying, like, oh, autism can be cured by better circumstances, <laughs> but we would have maybe more charitably yeah. read it as he wasn't autistic. He was very traumatized and then he got out of his shell and improved his condition and it wasn't actually neurodivergence Mm -hmm. it was just being very in a horrible situation right but portrayal remained pretty much the The same same note the entire it was the same note every episode it it was a choice and remember all nine episodes were just two nights of theater but it wasn't planned to be the kind of development it was it was the 80s yes and they you know this is pre-rain man which you know that's a problematic film for many other reasons but like I think that was the moment when a lot of just everyday people who didn't know someone with autism maybe started thinking differently about this particular condition and how they relate to people with it. Um, Mm -hmm. And so multiple times when you're having these check-ins, you reference Jamie Bell's performance in this Mm -hmm. film and you maybe I'll toss the baton to you here. (laughs) Like, what did you say back then? And now rewatching this film, do you feel like it holds up how you remembered? Yes. I remember it being, I remember it being like, like, obviously he has some type of scoliosis. That was their interpretation. He has like, kind of like the limping foot, kind of the, the bum leg. He has some type of stutter, I guess is kind of how they interpreted that, like some type of nervous stutter. And I liked that because I, because then it also kind of just showed as he progressed in the story, it, I, he did improve. He did become more confident, more relaxed around Nicholas. There was that. And I mean, the biggest thing is not to mean to David, who once again, very earnest portrayal. Mm-hmm. Not the my favorite, but his voice choice of kind of having the mouth always kind of lolling to her side, you know, and hanging open, it really kind of limited his speech. And so when he was trying to emote and give very heartfelt <laughs> moments yeah. like his death scene, 
it made it very hard to understand. And that really frustrated me to no end because when you watch the Jamie Bell death scene, he's it's very easy to understand. You feel the pain of the moment mm-hmm. and him doing the hot, like, please let I like, take away like the locket of hair so Kate doesn't know my true feelings. But before they put me in the ground, return it to me so I can at least be buried with it. Like that, that hurt my heart because I was like, the poor guy. And I mean, again, I understood a little bit more of that Kate Mike relationship that once again, the RC didn't quite hit on the head they, they hit it in weird ways because yeah, it they, was weird in in both versions his attraction for kate was very palpable right out of the gate yes and they never went anywhere with it <laughs> well the, i feel like you know that's in my mind that was one of the few places in the rsd version where they actually did show not tell which that we got like a lot of you know very you know in my mind very on the nose scenes <laughs> of spike being sad because kate is with frank yeah. <laughs> but we didn't have that kind of heart to heart scene where he talks to Nicholas about it. Yeah. And we talked then about when you were doing your adaptation mm-hmm. check in about, about how it differed from the book. We talked about how, you know, I thought like, you know, maybe more of like a glance or a knowing nod that mm-hmm. he and Nicholas would have been enough to supplement that. But I didn't know if we needed that heart to heart. We got the heart to heart in this yeah. version. And I liked it. I do too. But I mean, I will say one of the things I did like about the RC is the fact that they're quoting the play scenes. In, in, yeah. in the death scene. I did miss that. But mind you, because they cut a lot of that performance we, part of Well, yeah, we did not get our old Britannia. Yes. Um, big happy ending Romeo and Juliet <laughs> version. But, I know, oh, and well. I was really sad we didn't get that. But um, they did do other really interesting things. They did. The, like, they, as here, I, I wrote down a note here about that, but I thought that, yeah, they have a conversation, Nicholas and Smike, where Nicholas is trying to, like, learn his lines as Romeo, and mm-hmm. he connects the emotional depths required for playing Romeo with right. his father's advice from earlier in that opening montage right. about how finding the right person and that's the most important thing in life. And I thought that was just great setup and payoff, was- very good storytelling. And then right after that, Smike talks about how the trapdoor on the stage startled him and that gave mm-hmm. him excuse to exposit about his backstory. Right. And like to me, where was we lost a lot of the Crumbles plot line and specifically the Romeo and Juliet performance. Mm-hmm. I found they used that time very well, but it did come at the cost of that very emotional scene that we had True. in the yeah. RC well, Mind you, it was still a great Mike death scene. I mean, I, I mean, I absolutely prefer Jamie Bell's performance in this because not only is it more, not only is it more understandable verbally, but also I feel the interpretation of Smike's yeah. disabilities is way much more better handled I actually believe that Smike would run away and actually get pretty far that it would take a day to find him because he would have gotten pretty kind of hobbled himself along the road. Like like, like with David Ford's, I never believed for a minute that he would have escaped and gone very far. Yeah. Like, and, that, and that's too bad. But I mean, once again, it's there. there's some um, very good moments in David Ford's, but I really, if you're asking me which one does Mac prefer as an interpretation of Smike, Jamie Bell's. I feel that is a very solid well-intentioned adaptation of that character that I go, I get him. I feel for him. And I mean, the only thing I would have said is the beating scene with bears. I feel mm-hmm. we should have gone a little bit longer before yeah, um, agreed. steps in. And I feel there could be more of a scuffle for that stick. I mean, I think also in the RC one, doesn't Nicholas break the stick as well? Yeah. yeah. And I feel more... like I was like, why are you just throwing it down? His feet? That's a weapon. I, I, uh, and I was like, it's, it's not how he gets the scar. It's, Squeers jumps up and whacks him in the face and there's his scar for the rest of the movie. I don't know. So, Honestly, I was going to yeah. say this for the things I didn't love, but I have <laughs> enough things to touch on that I'll say this here. There was just not enough punching in this film. Like, I to know! Me, to I me, mean, that was the whole joke in this one, is that Nicholas punches his way out of yeah. everything. Well, and, and then, yeah, and then we have the iconic image of Roger Reese yes. with his fist in the air. Like, so many problems were solved with punching in the original or the original, the RSC version. I don't know how much is actually in the novel. <laughs> but yeah, like even things where we have the iconic punch, as we always called that scene of punching squares. Yeah. Here it was just like a little scuffle and then getting the switch and then beating him. I mean, we, there was just, there's something very viscerally satisfying about a good punch in the face. It's true. Like, in, you know, media, obviously in real life, it can be very bad and terrifying and we shouldn't yes. do it. And I don't condone violence, but but in, in media, yeah, I, I like a good punch. It's just, it's mm-hmm. fun. Punching can be fun. Yeah. And we we did not have enough of it in this version, mm-hmm. but it comes with the territory of having less camp, I suppose. Exactly. But yeah, so yeah, I definitely say Smike, very good interpretation. 
Well done, Ryan. What did you think of Smike's performances? Because you've never seen Jamie Bell's performance. No, Smike. like I've seen Jamie Bell and plenty of other things. I obviously knew he was a good actor. So when you told me that he played Smike, you I'm loved like, oh, yeah. him as Ben Grimm in uh, Fantastic Four. Yes, I did. <laughs> well, <laughs> everybody did. <laughs> everybody did. <laughs> no, but I love him as Billy Elliot. I loved him in what's it Never called? The Chris Evans train Snowpiercer. Um, yep, Snowpiercer. Yeah. yeah, he's a good actor. Like, I don't he's need to keep listing his, his IMDb. He has <laughs> the credentials. And yeah. And I do, just at the end of the day, two things I really liked. One, you know, we beat around the bush about this enough. I don't need to say more, but he, yeah, it was clearly not a caricature mm-hmm. of, you know, neurodivergence. He, you know, he had plenty of trauma. He had physical disabilities yeah. and that was enough. It's yeah. understandable that this character is shy and has trouble, you know, communicating and socializing mm-hmm. that we didn't need that extra layer. Yeah, I understand maybe why in the 80s that seemed like a reasonable direction to take it. But, you know, watching it in the 2020s, it really didn't hold up, Yeah, unfortunately. And the other thing I really liked about Jamie Bell here was that he was a kid. He, yeah. I, I don't actually know how old he was when they filmed this, but he was very clearly. I feel like he was probably like 17, 18. Yeah, he's a teenager, a child, basically. Mm-hmm. Like he... And I feel like that made him more at home in this, well, not at home, because he's very much not at home, but he felt like he belonged in this Yorkshire school environment among the other, like, orphans and children. And he, you know, he was kind of there for a long time. He's sort of on the cusp of, like, late teenage, early adulthood, but he Mm -hmm. still very much was this child, whereas David Brelthal looked like he was in his 40s, regardless of whether or not he was. And that's fine like it's the character could be older maybe he has been there for a really long time but they keep referring to him as the boy that young man like uh, so Mm -hmm. i yeah i felt like you really had to suspend some theatrical disbelief in the rc version whereas i genuinely i do think yeah jamie bell sold the youth that comes with this character as well and that really you know it becomes very sweet when he's pining after kate and he buys the ribbon and like you know, this is a kid having his first crush. He's only been around boys his whole life. And yeah. Fanny, but nobody, nobody likes the, Fanny. Which we'll Even get into nobody it, likes we'll, Fanny. <laughs> we'll get more into Fanny later. I have lots of Fanny thoughts. But yeah, I, I think that's enough to say, uh, Jamie Bell, if you're watching, great job. We really liked it. And we did. We do appreciate the nuances that you put into this particular interpretation of the character. Yes. All right, Ryan, give us your top three favorite things you really liked about this adaptation. Top three. Oh, because I know you got a whole so long list, but we are trying okay. to keep this thing moving. So give us your top three. Okay. Well, this is not going to count as my top three, but I'm just going to say okay. they, they took my notes about a lot of the things to cut. We've already addressed that. No Lily Vix. I love that there's no Lily Vix. The muffin scene <laughs> was gone. They trimmed yeah. the narration. They still had little bookend narrations, but yes. they proved that we did yeah. not need that much narration this whole time. More. More of a thematic narration yeah. this time around. Yeah. We talked, again, I'll just bookend that thought with how Tim Lincolnwater was missing, which I did suggest, even though I like him. But I thought it was weird that Miss LaCreevy was still there. And for one scene, like, yes. because, like, I felt like they had more planned for her. Maybe there's a bunch of deleted scenes. But Probably. if she was only going to be in that one scene, we really didn't need her and her... What I find most interesting about her is her relationship with Tim Lincoln Water. So if we're going to do away with him, <laughs> I don't know if she needed to be there either. Well, they needed Whatever. some place to go to, yeah. to move out to. So, But yeah, so my first, before I get into my top three, I will say I love that they detected the same things that I also agree were superfluous. Like, it, that was just a dramaturgical yeah. pat myself on the back satisfaction. Okay, first big one that I need to talk about, The Rescue. Rescuing Smike. I was about to say, I'm sure you have that as top of your list, that I do. Nickleby that saves Smike. Yes, well, I Not, said that yeah. in episode seven, which was my least favorite episode, because we I believe that it was probably faithful to Dickens that John was the superhero he who does just saved the, the day. Book. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is a bad storytelling decision. Sorry, <laughs> Dickens. <laughs> sorry, David Edgar. But yeah, sorry, Bob Peck. I thought you were really great and fun in it, but it's... I all of the notes that i had in my head for why like isn't nicholas the one doing this like my thinking was that we could just do away with the character of john almost all together but and i was I getting really upset if they cut him all together well based on what he did like he was very fun in this and he yes. like i i had like he you know he did his whole you know distraction you punched like, the schoolmaster <laughs> well yeah well even that when we first saw him 
before then because I thought true. For sure yes, he was... he's with walking with being or not being. Yeah, because we had we'd already cut the like awkward double date scene, which I thought yes, was really fun gone. in episode two, but we didn't need yeah. that. But my kind of thinking of that is like, well, if he's still in it, but we didn't have that, how are other things going to work as a result? Because there was kind of the tension of this guy is chasing after them. And, oh, I was flirting with his fiance before. This could be bad. And then he's like, you punched the schoolmaster. This is amazing. I love this guy. (laughs) And like, that's a fun moment. So I kind of felt like it seemed weird that he would chase them down just Mm -hmm. to be like, you punched the schoolmaster. Like it kind of some of the like plot points didn't feel like they made sense for keeping right. this character. And because they added those plot points for the express purpose of keeping him, I was like pretty sure that they were going to do the same faithful yet dumb thing of having John be the superhero. <laughs> but then they didn't. John comes back just to be an informant and a diversion. And that's Which is what great. I love. Like. Yeah. Yeah, and there was the great line, I wrote it down, of when Nicholas and John and Noggs are going over the plan, the rescue plan, (laughs) Noggs says, and I quote, May I offer an opinion with regards to this scheme? It seems foolhardy, redolent of danger, and doomed to failure. Otherwise, I find no fault with it. (laughs) End quote. And when he said that, you know, sassy Noggs, gotta love him. But when he said that, I thought for sure I was gonna be like, oh no, he's pointing out that this is a flawed plan. Now they're going to revert back to the other plan. And (laughs) all of this setup was just so they could like hat tip to me basically and be like, we thought about a better plan, but we're not going to do it (laughs) because we need to be faithful to Dickens. But no, but then Nicholas follows that line with it's for Smike. And then he goes on to do the rescue and John does some hilarious distraction to keep it out of the squeers from noticing. Some pub singing. Some pub singing. Well, that's good because we had the moment of John singing, at least in the RSC yeah. version. I'm sure that came from the novel too. So yeah. they found a way to work that into his new function. I thought it was great. Yeah. This is a master class in screenwriting and adapting yes. in particular. And this is kind of just a side point on that. This very clearly came out a year after the first Spider-Man, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie, because we right. had the moment of Little Wackford coming back into the room <laughs> and... Uh, and then just like, you know, cut over. We think he's going to spot them. And then, no, they're hiding out the window. And, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that was a visual reference being made. This was probably filmed before that movie was released, even yes. if it came out a year later. But I just thought like, OK, we are in early 2000s action adventure. <laughs> a la Sam Raimi, Spider-Man. Loved it. OK, so that's my big number one. Number two. I had originally suggested in my script doctoring that we can cut the character of Snolly and give his main function, which was to pretend to be Smike's father, right. to Gride, the goblin man who was going to marry Madeline. <laughs> who got cut anyway in this. Well, okay, that's where I'm going with this. So I had the suggestion that, okay, I understand why we have this plot point of pretending that someone else was Smike's father, <laughs> but we don't need this extra character for that when it could just be this character that we already hate. Right. And I thought we could consolidate some plot points by having like, oh, you're trying to thwart this wedding? Well, this man is your best friend's father and he's going to take him away. Like, they didn't do that, obviously. But no. This film also cut Snolly, but did something even better than what I was suggesting. They cut Gride too. They cut Gride too. And they rightly realize that we actually don't need the Maury Povich, this man is Smike's real father moment, that that, we get enough of that later with Ralph. But they gave Gride's big plot point, well, his main plot point, that he's the one who they're coercing Madeline into marrying, to Mulberry Hawk. And oh my god, that just makes so much sense. It's a character who we already dislike, who we know is basically a rapist, Mm -hmm. who's bad news. So... The goblin gride man, I call him the goblin because that's a callback he was a to <laughs> when it took several episodes before they referred to him by name. So I was just referring to him as the goblin in a lot of our episodes. <laughs> but yeah, so gride, you know, you see this man like, oh my God, he's so old and horrible. Like, of course, she doesn't want to marry him. But instead, we got, you know, you know, we don't have to just project our hatred mm-hmm. of this guy based on his physical appearance mm-hmm. and possible villainy that we actually give this role to a character who we know is villainous. And that just made it so much better. And then it intertwined very nicely with a lot of the things that um, also got cut with Lord Frederick, which I was a little disappointed about because I really liked Lord Frederick's Gambit. I I know. I thought they were going to combine him and Frank. 
into yeah. one character. Like, I was well, like, they, oh, is this where we're going? That was, yeah. Like, I still like how Lord Frederick was characterized here. The actor who played him, who I wrote down, Nicholas Rowe, did a very yes. good job and made him a lot more honorable than he was in the previous version. Yeah. He doesn't he, die! And yeah, he did. That. That's on my other list. Okay, he doesn't have his big duel. Okay, had I known you were going to bring that up, I wouldn't have mentioned it here. But I really liked how they found this other different, but in my mind, better use of the character of Mulberry Hawk mm. that actually ratcheted up the tension because we yeah. know how bad this guy is. And yes. it, to me, it was just a brilliant way of economizing characters that actually intensified mm -hmm. the story rather than being like, well, this is what we yeah. have to do. I said at the beginning of this, necessity mm -hmm. is the mother of invention and having a two hour runtime births some really brilliant yeah. stuff like this. It so, does. Okay, let me see. I only get one more. Let me you see only get what. one more. I had a lot of them here. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll say this one. Um, Madeline, played by Anne Hathaway here. She's kind of always been a non-character. She's not in it a lot. We don't get a lot with her. But I like how they started establishing her relationship with Nicholas earlier. We have a that lot of That was one of mine. Okay, yeah. so, okay, I'm glad we're on the same hat. I know you were going to bring it up. I would have used one of my other, but whatever, I'm committed. That, you are committed now. <laughs> no, but it wasn't just that they added more meat cute scenes, although that was a yeah. big part of it. But <laughs> the version of her that we had in the RSC version, she was played by Lucy Gutteridge. Yes. She was making some acting choices that conceptually I get. She's mm -hmm. traumatized. Her mother's dead. Her, she, her father is horrible. They are destitute. So she was putting a lot of, you know, emotional armor up. And yes. not, you know, not having like a fun, cutesy, flirty rapport with Nicholas. Mm -hmm. I get it as an acting choice. But it always seemed like any time they were in a scene together, it was a real chore for her to interact with him. Yeah. And as a result, it kind of made it hard to believe like these two are supposed to end up together. Like what does he even see in her aside from the fact that she's pretty? Like she is not like into you, man. Get over it. Like, <laughs> and so I like that Take by that establishing... Hint. So it's not only just establishing that there was more interaction with the character, but they genuinely seem to be into each other. Anne Hathaway is into Charlie Hunnam. Like, uh, that, and you know, we've seen him without his shirt on. It's not hard to see why, but like, he's, yeah, the very strange scene in the Yorkshire school where he's like super jacked. It's weird, but like, I know. I don't know why he was shirtless, but whatever. But yeah, I do like that, yeah, Hathaway's version still had the trauma she had a very like you know deep she has a great line scene where yeah. she's like i don't want to be like to be hurt by you is yeah like far worse I, I, and i wrote down the quote not the yeah. whole quote but what i thought was kind of a testament to the trauma that they were still informing her character with is mm -hmm. quote nicholas i feel you know what it's like to be without happiness but do you know what it's like to be afraid of it mm -hmm. to see the world is so conniving that you cannot take pleasure in the appearance of something good because you suspect there is only a painted drop behind which other troubles lie. That has been my life, end quote. And then she goes on to yeah. profess, but I hope it will be different with you because I feel so safe. Like, mm -hmm. the, you know, we didn't lose any of her trauma, but still right. made her, you know, someone who was mm -hmm. able to be happy and seem genuinely mm -hmm. interested in having a relationship with our protagonist. Yeah. So if I have to do a top three, that definitely made the cut for me. Very good. Okay. Nope. Nope. Well, my top three, so Madeline's, Earlier appearances was one of them. I picked that off right away of, oh, wow, we're getting in Hathaway, like, right off the top. She, like, she's in that very first scene with, with Nicholas and, and what's his name? Ralph. With yeah. Ralph, like, right off the top of the film. I was like, great, love that. What else was there? Once again, the Squeers marriage, I loved how we got a better interpretation of that with the, you actually did feel the diabolical love between these two horrible people. And then... Mulberry Hawk made both my lists of things I liked and things I didn't like. Hmm. I I totally loved how they adapted and kind of combined his him with Bride and uh, what's his name, the other one? Snolly. Well, Snolly, he wasn't even combined with Snolly. Snolly was just cut. I had suggested we turn, yes. we combine Yes, Yeah, sorry, yes. Snolly. Bride and, basically, yes, Bride and Snolly yeah. and, and Mulberry Hawk's story. I thought that was very well done. I thought that was a very solid adaptation choice there. I get it. Mm -hmm. And then... I also thoroughly enjoyed the crummels and the and their all their stuff there. That was once again, as you said, the fact they didn't draw attention to Barry Humphreys. It was just Barry Humphreys as Mrs. Crummels. I was like, bravo, well done film. 
That's how we should be doing these types of things. Don't make it into a big social deal. Just cast, move on, let them play their part. Don't need to make a big statement about it. Just treat it as if it's anybody else who's being cast in this. That is the way it works so well because it doesn't make a statement. It's just, this is it. We live it, move on. So I thoroughly enjoyed that. I also love the Smite guest scene. As I said, it was very emotional, very well done. What else did I really love? Yeah, no, let's go with that. Let's go with that. Like, I want to touch on a lot of them, but I definitely will say that this was a very solid adaptation. All their adaptation choices I thoroughly understood. And now we're going to get into things we quite didn't quite like about this. And I'll start this one because I feel, I feel like you may protest me on some of them. So... First off, I felt this film lacked some classic Hollywood action, you know, kind of to help amp up the story a bit. Like, say what you will about the RSC version. Nicholas Nickleby, that one, there was action in that. There, there was momentum. There was some energy there. And I, you could feel at certain times they were trying to build the tension and the energy, like Kate in, in the theater box. It didn't quite reach the same level I think it needed to really be truly terrifying and truly as horrible as it needed to be same thing with the fact that cut mulberry hawk and what's his name lord not not lord farquaad lord frederick lord frederick very soft yes yeah yes so the fact that like in in the book and in the rc version they have a duel he dies nicholas attacks mulberry hawk in the carriage and he gets the great mad eye moody Oh Star yeah, they cross. still had the version of that of him attacking him in the bar. It wasn't really an attack. Character. It was more he hit him over the head with a stick and Nicholas throws the stick away. Well, yeah, but they still had their scuffle. So the fact that they didn't go out It was carriage. a verbal scuffle. Like, I, I, the fact no, it was that physical. Like, uh, there was no pun- yeah, was like punching physical. because it was still physical. Know. It wasn't as physical as I would have liked to be. Like, you watch the RC version, you have the falling rice and the rain and the carriage yeah. and him falling off and getting scarred and that really kind of Oh, get that, Nicholas, once and for all. <laughs> then he flees to Australia or France, wherever it is. But the fact that, like, the villains didn't quite get all their comeuppance I wanted them to get. Hmm. That was a big problem for me, where, like, Waxford Squeers ends up going into Australia. The other Squeers get attacked in the schoolhouse. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I would like to find out if those kids will be okay. That was one of my yeah, that, like, complaints where it's like, where, where, about where, the where it's like The ending felt too happy. The RSC version felt nice. Like it had a nice resolution for Nicholas, but also didn't let you off the hook of, oh, everybody's Oliver twisting at the end of Oliver where food, glorious food, yay, Fagin survives. And he's dancing off into the sunset, you know? Right. Like yeah. that's kind of what this version felt like. Where it's like, yes, and Nicholas lived out his days with the graves overlooking the house. And the other one where it's like, because Nicholas picks up the dying child at the end, kind of showing yeah. that Nicholas's journey of, you know, helping and whatever is still ongoing. He's not just going to be, and now I get my happy ending. It was like, like there's a bit more, once again, that was like, that's what, that was Dickens. Dickens never gave you the perfect happy ending. It's kind of like a good problem Shakespeare play, like Twelfth Night. And it, it doesn't, it, it leaves you with questions at the end of, is it so happy? Are we totally sure that Madeline and Nicholas like each other? They kind of have a bit of a... I'm glad they do like each other. In yeah, this is what they clearly do. Yeah. But it's like, I, you know, I, I, those, I'll call like, that like, a positive. They kind of botched the, the, the suicide scene. With Christopher Plummer there didn't quite hit the emotional mark it needed to. And then he kind of does the weird trapdoor fall, which was kind of a bit... Well, nip. yeah, that's... So if I could jump in on that, because that was definitely yeah, one jump, of mine. Yeah, jump. But then, yeah, like the fact that Mr. What's his name, Mulberry Hawk, doesn't get his proper comeuppance of a scar in the eye and kicked out of yeah. the country, you know, or... Squares doesn't go off to Australia. I was like, the villains need a bit more of a comeuppance in this. They kind of got rushed at the end there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. yes. His suicide. Ralph's, Ralph's suicide was a big one for me because I was really happy with the reveal scene. That was another that was moment where, yeah, well, t- because to me, that was another thing that, you know, a recurring critique I had of the RC version was that Nicholas himself wasn't involved in a lot of the big plot points yes. or the big sort of tide turning plot points. Mm-hmm. So like the fact that it was the Nogs and the Cherubles alone with Mr. Brooker who told Ralph right. that uh, Spike and Susanna, like, couldn't Nicholas have been here for that? Like, <laughs> couldn't, you know, maybe this is a reveal for him too. And he also has this emotional reaction to it. So I like that, even though, you know, he clearly got the news in advance from um, mm-hmm. from Nogs, I like that he was at least there to sort of give this blow yeah. and that we actually had Nogs and Nicholas present to see the hanging out of the trap door. I thought that, that was... I did like. But the thing I didn't like is how quickly we pivoted to our happy ending from mm-hmm. there. 
like the fact that we actually had two of our main characters witness this hanging I feel like we should sit with that a little more, if not for our, the mm-hmm. audience's sake, then at least for their sake as characters, because yes. they, you know, maybe Nogs wanted Ralph dead at some points in his life, but I don't think Nicholas ever wanted Ralph dead. No, he no, wanted him to just really wish. Yeah. Death. Yeah. So I, the fact that we even had them there present that, I would have liked to just be like, oh, like maybe even like run and try to save him, try to cut the rope off, but oh no, it's too late. Like, I felt like- That would have been good. Like, once again, a little bit more action, a little bit more- Yeah. Well, Something and more... to drive that energy there. Because it just kind of felt like this piece never really, I don't want to say meandered, but it kind of mm-hmm. just walloped through the field. It, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it just kind of, it rolled. It didn't quite, it's... like, the energy level it needed to really kind of feel the adventure. I... I would chalk that up to the fact that the novel has the episodic structure True. and they had a checklist of ones that they had to deal with. The crumbles, right. I think, is one of them and that eats mm-hmm. up a lot of time, but it's an iconic part of the story, mm-hmm. so you have to have the crumbles. Yeah. We'll talk about the crumbles in a bit. But that's um, where I go, they, they did a little bit of it where they were cutting back to Kate's misadventures, well, but they didn't quite hit the level of misadventure that I think they needed to really kind of offset yeah. Nicholas is off being Simba and Nakuna Matari, and you know. Yeah. And well, I, I, it would be great to have a montage of, sure. of Nicholas spent. on the road touring. Yeah, walking across to, the log. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like exactly, and then Kate back at home fending off Mulberry Hawk at, repeatedly yes. throughout the city, where it's like, Agreed. oh, she's in a tea shop. Mulberry Hawk is right there. Just yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like that type anyway, of thing. Anyway, anyway, we are running out of time. So, I'll kind of, yeah, to me, just to wrap up the Ralph suicide, it just, yeah. it could have been great. I loved the singer out, the one legged singer out the that window. Was I thought great that, that was great. But then I felt like it was squandered when the actual, like, act of falling yeah. out the trap door, basically to me, and how quickly we whiplashed over to the happy marriage. It, to me, it just felt like we were in this position of, oh, right, Ralph is still alive. Let's make quick business of that so we can move on. <laughs> we've so, got to kill him, so let's just get it done. So that was something I was not crazy mm-hmm. about. We've talked about Kate enough, so I think we can kind of put a pin in yeah, her. Yeah, I think she we was... all can agree that she kind of got underserved in this adaptation. Yeah, agreed. And part of that is the consequence of losing the Mantellinis. Which, As I was saying, we didn't get the Mandalini. Which that was you missing had, too. Well, <laughs> you suggested that. Repeatedly when, comedic suicide. It's, well, it's, well, when I was doing my script doctoring, <laughs> I didn't mention the Mantellinis, and you brought them up of like, well, that for time we could cut them, and I agreed with you at yeah. the time. But now without them, I do feel like Kate gets underserved because we jump straight to arriving in London to, and now this man is trying to rape you. Like, it's, yeah. um, that, it's a shame. Like, we also and, lost what's her name, the one that was sickly. That Kate goes to the oh, doctor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I forget her name, but yeah. no great loss there. She was funny, but we really don't need her. But... I know, but I would have liked either part, her name or her character to be in there sure. to kind of show her misadventures in the city, right? Yeah. Like that thing okay. Of, you know, anyway. So the one kind of last sort of one that I do feel like I need to bring up because I've hinted about it enough is... I know. You got to talk about it. Fanny. Here's the problem. Poor Fanny. No, I love Fanny. I loved her in the other version. I love <laughs> her in this version. I thought for sure that Fanny wasn't going to be in this version. And I really? even su- well, I suggested to my script doctoring that if we want to keep Fanny, I don't know if we actually need her attraction to Nicholas. Right. Because I kind of brought up the point that the function she serves is just this vindictiveness towards the family. And that can right. happen just fine without this personal vindictiveness towards like the letter, not Fanny. Yeah. So when we went 23 minutes of this movie without seeing Fanny after already spending a lot of time in Yorkshire, I thought, oh, maybe Fanny isn't in this version. And then she shows up. And I was like, <laughs> okay, it's fine. I like Fanny. I'm happy to see her. The actress who played her, Heather Goldenhirsch, is Golden very... Hirsch. Yeah, good job. Yeah. I like you a lot. I feel like this is going to feel, feel like a strange critique. She's too pretty. Like, <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or a critique, but like... It almost doesn't make sense why Nicholas is still so mean to her. Like I they, get it though. I mean, she represents. I mean, they she, do a good job of that. His lash out at her isn't so much of "I don't love you." It's more he's just seen the squeers I, mistreating people. He's yeah, but he's he, gone out for a walk. She tries to get on him, and he's like, "Fuck off!" No, well, like, I don't like you or your family or well, the situation. Leave me alone. I don't feel like we had enough time with her to mm. justify his connecting her with her terrible family he oh, didn't see true. her abuse children 
And like, he didn't see that in the previous version too. She was very clingy and awkward to him and he wasn't attracted to her. So he was like, no, go away. This is bad. And I'm very attracted to your friend who I didn't realize was engaged, but like, um, (laughs) but which, you know, I'm glad that they kind of did away with the Tilda love triangle plot. It was very fun, very fun, but we didn't need it. But I thought it didn't make sense why he was being so, I get that they tried to write in that justification that it was more about her family, but it, to Mm -hmm. me, it just still didn't work. And she was cute in this version she's i like, found her homely i i think they were, I think they were, I, I think they were going less for <laughs> like physically not attractive more just she is homely and not a nice person like kind of a yeah. bit of a i think they were trying to get away from oh she's got the wart which makes her the ugly one it's well, more like yeah. no her See, kid, like with, no her inner person is not nice either. with suzanne burtish who played yeah. her it, the fact that she, you know, they made her up to be very haggard, but we yes. know the that one eye, she, she the one yeah, eye but we know that the actress isn't because she also played Mrs. Snivellici, the famous yes. actress, and was, you know, very attractive there. And yes. in fact, Nicholas is attracted to her there. So that kind yes. of played up some of the theatricality of like, it's She also okay. played the evil maid to Gride as well. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah she had a few other characters, but yeah. the fact that she also played Snivellici showed that like, yeah. okay, you're allowed to think she's horrid looking because that's not her. But like, I recently watched for the first time the film She's All That, the 90s kind of Pygmalion teenage Oh, yeah, I haven't watched that in a long time. Yeah, with Freddie Prince Jr. And the girl in that, I forget the actress's name, but there's she's a very attractive young lady. There's nothing wrong with her. And yet they have to do makeover montage upon makeover montage to <laughs> convince the hottest guy in school that maybe she's dateable. Like, it right. doesn't make a lick of sense. And I felt the same way about this Fanny. She's fine. And Nicholas didn't see her be bad enough to justify right. on any count why he disliked her so much. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, and honestly, we didn't see her be bad. She Her one scene with him prior was flirting with him about her pen. Right, like, he's and, totally ignoring her. He's yeah, like, which like, sure, yeah. he's ignoring her, but like if she was, you know, hilariously bad looking, I could understand why he wouldn't be into it, but it just, right. to me, it just didn't make sense. So yeah. I felt like Fanny, yeah, it didn't solve the problems that I had with Fanny and it made me just a little more confused by them. So that <laughs> I felt like that needed to be addressed here. That's fair, that's fair, that's fair. All right, um, Ryan, you wrote this one because you really want to talk about them. The Crummles. Okay, so I separated this out into its own little section here. I know we are coming close on time, but um, okay, because so. I, I couldn't decide which category to put the Crummles into, the things I liked or the things I didn't. Oh, okay. Because on one hand, I liked them. Nathan Lane and Dame Edna, wonderful, hilarious performances. But the big problem with the Crummles that I had in the other version didn't get solved here. And we, you know, you just mentioned Timon and Pumbaa and yes. hey, it's Nathan Lane. Isn't that funny? But she got Ernie Sabella in there. As, uh, well, as yeah, as like I, that would have been really funny, funny, but I don't imagine that kind of parallel is on purpose because that was <sighs> yeah. just something that we sort of noticed watching the other version. But my big critique in my script offering with the Crummles was that if you're going to have them and devote this much time to them, you got to justify why they're important to the plot. They can't just mm-hmm. be a distraction. Nobody would remember Timon and Pumbaa if after Simba sees his cloud dad and leaves, if we never saw Timon and Pumbaa again, or just saw them as for one little like stinger gag at the end, nobody would care. But we care about Timon and Pumbaa because of they call me Mr. Pig. (laughs) But they play an integral role in the climax of the story. And while we were radically reducing the time spent with the crumbles on here because we didn't have this like yeah. big nine hour canvas, we, yeah, they didn't feel any more served. I, like they weren't serving the story. Like it was fun. And but I, I feel like be, they would have been better if they got brought back as part of the smite distraction. Kind of like they run into sure. the crumbles in the yeah. city and, and Nicholas says, hey, yes, you guys do that. a performance in the pub and distract Squeers. What's his name? Tom? No. John. John. John and I are going to go get sure. Smike, Nogs, you keep a lookout. Yes, and that that cuckoo, would be a they call me Mr. Pig moment. Coming. But yeah. to me, yeah, to me, like, we didn't do enough with them to better earn their presence. And as a right. result, I still just feel like their presence here was just box ticking of these are things people expect to see in a Nicholas Nickleby movie. We need the crumbles. You need the crumbles, but we didn't do enough with them. And we had, 
and I get that the theater version really played up the theater characters, but yeah. this film version, I don't think needed them as much. But I, well, I it's counter- interesting that you talk, say about the film version didn't quite need them as much. The film opens with like a, a stage. little diorama, yeah, diorama little. stage. And I think it's Disney who does the opening narration too, right? As well as the Maybe. closing one. I don't or, know. I, I mean, he for sure does the closing because they tie it back into yeah. his wedding speech. But I don't know if he does the opening. That's that thing of. I felt like they were trying to make more of a theater acknowledgement of, hey, the Crummels and th- Nicholas could be in theater. So we have this kids paper theater here too. Yeah. Like I, I, I think scenes from the movie that you're going to see. I think they were doing, trying to do that, but yeah. because Didn't it work. is a, because it is a film, it has to work twice as hard to engender those connections. Whereas mm-hmm. the fact that the other one was theater, just that came yeah. with the territory. But the the one kind of big problem, especially that made me unsure of how I felt about the Crumbles, was the infant phenomenon. Yeah, that didn't work on. on well, film here's at all. here's the problem with that, and I know why it didn't work because we had an adult actress playing her as a child right. in the stage version. But because it's a stage version and all of the actors are adults, even little Wackford, yes. we suspend our disbelief. And I actually just took it on good faith that that was supposed to be a child, uh, right. maybe too old for the parts she's playing child, but a child right. nonetheless. In this version, they made a very big thing about how the crumbles are basically malnourishing her. In order to oh, keep turning her to an alcoholic, they're giving yeah, her watered well, down gin. Yeah, and that's her entire diet. So, yeah, my thing here is: wait a minute, we've just come from the Yorkshire School mm-hmm. at this point. Yeah, and we've just had like child abuse be a very mm-hmm. big thing in the story. Yes. That when we get that, and it's kind of played as like, isn't this a fun, cute thing that these characters are doing? It did not work for me at all. No. Like. This is basically Squeer's business. Like, yes. so I, oh, I did not. And I, I'll tie, I'll piggyback off that for a minute. Sure, go it, for it. It goes back to my list of things I didn't love about the movie. Is I feel they could have gone further with the drudgery of Victorian London. It felt mm-hmm. too bright and too clean. And I yeah. feel like that's how, what's your name? The child wonder kind of got swept under the rug. It's like, oh, it's Nathan Lane. And it's a light, happy, see, we're nodding, dreary, dre, Squeer's land. So. It must be okay. Meanwhile, if it was real, it would have been like dirty, grimy, gross world. And yeah. that probably would have fit in better. Yeah. That that even I, the, like even the crumbles are not the most I agree we brilliant didn't get or kind hearted of people. They are opportunists, let's put it nicely. Let's yeah, but they are, yeah. You know what I we mean? We got like one good moment that sort of did the function of, yeah, London is grimy and bad at the at the end of our like five minute prologue sequence smash right. cut to London Smog. And I felt like yes. that did enough that we didn't need to keep like, I wanted all the way into it. it. I was like, yeah, give me like nineteen sixty eight Oliver boys on the mill wheel, grinding the like horrible sour berry land, you know, like Yeah. Like, like lean to, into it. Like it's a movie. You can do that more than on stage. Like, sure. Show me grimy London. Victoria yeah. London was not pretty. It was not idyllic. It was smoggy. It was gross. It was cold. It was miserable. There should be no sun. <laughs> Fair. All right. I think, yeah. So my just sort of big eyebrow racing with the crumbles was we've just come back from the bad child abuse people. And Nicholas has no problem with the child abuse that is happening here. These are but they're great. kind-hearted people. Well, I know lame. that's the thing. It just really that didn't work for me. So <laughs> I, I had to. Uh, I couldn't, in good faith, put the crumbles in. But I like them. They're great. <laughs> Call them that's because fair. of that. Yep. No, that's totally fair. That is totally fair. And I mean, now that you bring it up, I'm like, yeah, that is a bit weird that Nicholas wouldn't have said more about, hey, you're abusing your child and turning yeah. turning them into an alcoholic. But you know so what? For I... the sake of. Sorry, for the I, sake of for the sake of publicity right but you know what i did love what? i loved helen cummings dance that we get like the little fake out i did gonna... and i was like why do oh. we keep cutting back is this like well, a, it was in joke from the film or like everyone well, it was just... coming to dance but we couldn't get it in elsewhere like no what I, is I the thought... point of this we're on running well, joke i was questioning why get such a big actor to play such a small role and to me that dance at the end sold it that we had to fake out of can i show you my dance and then he doesn't get to do it and then we get to see it at the wedding and it was a great hoot and a holler of a good time sure. I, I liked it <laughs> anyway. that's fair i mean for me i just went this feels like a joke at the oscars it just goes on way too long i, I felt like it was just the right amount of time i mean i mean i mean i mean alan cummings character is meant to be the one from the, the rsc version the one's like 
Right, the so one he punches. Tragedy. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. He punches and we did not have enough punching in this movie. I know. We should have had quite... more punching. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Once again, right. I... Once again, the film just lacks some well-needed action energy yeah. to keep carrying Nicholas from episode to episode of, oh, crap, I punched an actor. I, got to say, I guess I got to go on the run again. <laughs> well, that wasn't why. I know. But... I know. But it's All that right. thing of, need, like, it needed some more energy. But either way, yeah, Alan coming out, I was on the back and forth because he's very funny in this part. He looks mm -hmm. like Lord Farquaad. He does. Uh, <laughs> with his bowl cut. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's a lot of fun. I mean, once again, I mean, I think we can head into our last thoughts unless you got more on the crumble. No, I think that's enough. I, I've right. said my piece. Okay. It's okay. We were getting to okay. the end. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, for me, I go, this was a lot of fun. I thoroughly enjoyed this revisit. I think this is a great partner piece to the RSC version where if you watch all nine of those episodes and then come over to here, you will, as Ryan said, you'll see a lot of our script doctor in conversation actually does end up making it into this adaptation so check it out for that reason to see what our potential st script suggestion ideas would have come out to be and i mean i agree with you ryan i think this should have been nominated if not won the oscar for best adapted screenplay because yeah. adapting a dickens novel into a two-hour movie that's not a musical is not easy <laughs> agreed yeah. But yeah, Ryan, what do you think? Give us your like final I said words. it all at the beginning. I think this is just it is a masterclass in screenwriting, mm -hmm. especially for adapting. It I enjoyed it from beginning to end. I kind of like gasped and cheered throughout. You primarily at my just delight of seeing the brilliant choices that were made in the screenwriting process. But yeah, this the talented actors just across mm -hmm. the board, that's no surprise. It <laughs> You know, it is really well directed. Douglas McGrath isn't just a great writer. He has a great cinematic eye. I loved mm -hmm. one super minor thing, but the, in the opening montage, we had Kate painting a portrait of their father. And then when yeah. Nicholas is in Yorkshire, he looks at that painting. And that's I just love a, that moment. That is efficient visual storytelling. Like, yep. We did not need a single word in either of those scenes, but it was just perfect. So I, for all of the little misgivings that I have here and there, I think this is a wonderful film. Mm -hmm. I would encourage anyone to watch it, regardless of your other previous experience with other adaptations. And honestly, I'm glad I watched this one second, because I don't mm -hmm. think I would have enjoyed the RSC one nearly as much if mm -hmm. I had seen this first. Well, so, I mean, we made very concerted efforts to not show you this. Yes. Because <laughs> there's just certain clips of, like, Jamie Bell, where I was like, you need to see Jamie Bell. Yeah. And just to see what I'm talking Lane. about. <laughs> but I'm not going to show you the full thing. And yeah. I mean, I'm glad we waited because, yeah, this was a lot of fun. A year later, our happy anniversary to our first mini series review of Nicholas Nickleby. Here, here. here. Ryan, here. before we go, give us that classic Ryan Barakovich send off we all love. Well, not active on social media, so don't bother following me. If you mm -hmm. like me, just follow the cup at COH Theater on all platforms. Like, share, and subscribe. But Ryan, what about uh, it's uh, about sending you a happy birthday or happy belated well, birthday at this point? By the, by the time this airs, my birthday will have been like a month ago. So <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, All, right. But All right. Happy birthday, though. Yes. Happy birthday, Ryan. Thanks. Um, yes. This was a good I gift, say... getting to watch this film <laughs> yes, and talk exactly. about it. Exactly. I will say for me, you can follow me at Mackenzie Horner on all social media platforms. Follow my musical antics at Cup of Hemlock Theater, where we actually did a two-part episode all about the musical Oliver. So if you mm -hmm. want to hear more Dickens talk, that is the place to go. Check it on out. Other than that, everybody, let us know what other play to film adaptations you want us to cover. Do you want us to cover Doubt? Noise we'll is talk off, off screen. <laughs> we, don't, <laughs> Death of a we don't need to put it to a poll, but if anybody really does want to get in the comments, If we'll there's one you really want up. us to talk about, we will happily discuss. <laughs> Either way, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.